Welcome to our speaker series um, on April 26th. It's really all about uh, leveraging innovation. So for those who I haven't met, I'm Keith Forrester, Vice President of Marketing, Sales and Business Development for Kaiser Permanente in the Northwest. I'm very glad that you're taking time to join us today. We have a terrific panel of experts, all of whom really play a role in not only how uh, we provide integrated care, but how we bring uh, innovation uh, to that care. And the innovation is really around that triple A, right? How do we bring out the be or um, cause the best outcomes? How do we great, create a, uh, a terrific member experience while also lowering the rate of inflation uh, for healthcare? So um, I'll be joining this conversation from time to time just to ensure that we're focused on what this all means to you as employers and brokers. And so look forward to uh, doing that um, over the next hour and a half. Let me move now to introducing our moderator. You can see her picture there, Jennifer Stacy. Um, Jennifer has uh, been a moderator for a number of our, our seminars and does a terrific job. She's our director over strategic accounts and dental. And that means she leads the account team that serves our regions uh, largest, most sophisticated accounts, uh, typically in the public sector. Um, she's also responsible for dental, sale, dental sales and service and helps ensure the achievement of our high level, highest levels of service. And it's my uh, privilege really to turn this over to you, Jennifer. Look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Keith, and thanks to all of you for joining today. I'll start with some quick housekeeping. Your cameras are turned off and your microphones are muted, but it doesn't mean that you can't join the conversation. We've incorporated questions that we received with your RSVPs into the actual presentation, but we'll also be taking chat questions. So if you want to use the Q&A function, you can send those in and we'll try to incorporate those and we'll leave some time for the end so that you can interface with our panelists. So as Keith mentioned, we are joined today by four doctors that play essential roles in how we're improving care and total health for all of us. I am so pleased to introduce our panel, starting with Dr. Keith Bachman. He is a primary care internist, and in addition to his clinical work, he serves as a Permanente Physician Ambassador who connects the needs of our employer group customers to the care delivery system. He is also the medical director for our Northwest uh, Workforce Health Team. He's a cyclist, musician, and I always enjoy hearing uh, stories of his travels. Dr. Sheila Gensale is also a primary care internist, and like Dr. Bachman, she serves as a physician ambassador. She is the physician lead for our Eugene Chase Gardens Medical Office. She began her diverse career at Sunnyside Medical Center, and then she moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where she had a successful pr private practice for many years. We're fortunate that Dr. Gonzale rejoined Kaiser Permanente in 2018 and that she now calls Lane County home. As a daughter of immigrant parents, she embraces community values and respect for all cultures. Dr. Allison Nalloway is a distinguished investigator and the associate director for the Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Research. Her research focuses on the evaluation of vaccine safety and effectiveness and on the surveillance of vaccine preventable and other infectious diseases. She also monitors vaccine safety with the CDC funded vaccine safety data link. When the pandemic's over, she hopes to have hobbies again, and she is looking forward to gardening with her son, bike rides, and learning to play pickleball. And then finally, Dr. Imelda Deconis is the president and chief executive officer of Northwest Permanente Medical Group, where she leads more than 1,700 physicians, clinicians, and administrators. She is a passionate advocate for addressing the social and environmental de determinants of health, and she's working to transform culture, practice, and the business of medicine. Under her leadership, Northwest Permanente became the first medical group in the world that B-Lab certified as a B Corporation. And while I've only ever seen her drink veggie smoothies, I hear she does like cheesecake. <laughs> Welcome to you all and thank you for joining us. 
I will start first with the agenda. We are going to have some time today to hear the latest on the COVID-19 vaccine. Then we'll learn about the role that Kaiser Permanente's research played in developing and bringing vaccines safely to our communities. And then we'll hear more about innovations that have a direct impact on total health. As I mentioned, if you have uh, questions that you'd also like answered, please put them in the chat for us and we'll follow along. So Dr. DeConis, uh, let's start with you if that's okay. It feels sure. like information in the news is changing practically on an hourly basis. So can we start with just sharing the yeah. latest on the vaccines and how that's going in our area, please? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everyone. Thank you again for joining us as part of our speaker series focusing on innovations and learnings from the pandemic. So if it feels like it's changing hourly or daily, uh, that's probably because in some regards uh, it is. So let's start with the latest on the vaccines. As many of you have, maybe all of you have heard J&J, &J, the pause ended April 23 and as early as Saturday, we resumed with the FDA lifting that pause to resume vaccinating with J&J, &J, especially as it was paused earlier this month when there came reports of rare blood clots. Uh, right now, totaling 15 people out of approximately 8 million doses. So about 12 of those cases are in women, 30 to 39 years old. And when you consider 125 deaths per 1 million from COVID-19, the both the safety data and the review and the risks and benefits out outweigh still giving the J and J. Also, during discussion, we can also talk about Pfizer and Moderna and the other vaccines that are we're learning more are effective against the known variants and children. So a few weeks ago, Pfizer re requested FDA to approve and expand the emergency use authorization for children 12 years and older. And it is possible that as early as fall this year, we will start vaccinating kids. Lastly, just a word on breakthrough cases. If you've been hearing about some people testing positive two weeks out or more from their dose of vaccine, those breakthrough cases are extremely rare. And to date of about 75 million vaccinated, there have been close to 5,800 of such patients or people, and that's about 0.008%. On the vaccine distribution with J&J &J Resume, that's about 10 million doses that will be added back to the supply off the shelves. And as you might imagine, those are still very, very useful, particularly for our hard to reach population, our homeless, homebound, in addition to the incarcerated population. But still, there needs to be ongoing more at work and focus on the most vulnerable people of color, Black, Indigenous, in addition to those populations. For Oregon, the percentage of vaccinated are mirroring the national rate. So we have about 42% of the population who've received one dose and 28% about fully vaccinated. As you know, the vaccine is now open to all 16 year old and older. And lately in the last 14 days, we have been seeing a higher rate of positivity in Oregon, but per capita, we still have fewer cases compared when you look at the numbers from the Northeast as well as the Midwest. So just by comparison, we have about 18 positive per 100,000 where Michigan, where you've probably seen, um, it's 54 per 100,000 and as slow as six per 100,000 in some states, including, including California. The distribution of vaccines has gone down a little bit from a peak of about 3.3 million doses per day, and it's running over 2.7 million per day. And we know that about 8% of the population missed their second shot per on the schedule and we'll need to catch up. And lastly, if you're following the worldwide, um, there is a crisis 
there's crises in several countries and uh, India is right now uh, one of the ones that uh, keep showing in the in the international news. So those are some highlights and happy to discuss more during the discussion. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Dr. Deconis. That was a wide range of information. So we'll plan yeah. to dip down into some of that as we go through. And I'm sure some of our audience uh, members will help guide us where they'd like to go with some of that. I would like to turn to Dr. Gonzale. So the experience in Lane County has been, I think, a little bit different than what we've seen in the Portland metro area. So in the Quad Counties and the Southwest Washington, what are you hearing from your community members about getting vaccinated and, and really how are people doing? Yeah, thanks for that. And again, thanks for everyone for including me with my teammates and friends. This is exciting um, and it's exciting work we're doing in Lane County. Um, I think that when, when COVID broke out, there was a lot of questions about when there's gonna be a vaccine, who gets the vaccine. The vaccine came out, three vaccinations in 11 months. And I've never felt so supported by, you know, my organization of KP to broadcast messages to us uh, in Lane County, two hours from Portland, to feel secure and confident confident about the messages that we had to give to the rest of the community because the rest of the community and some of the local hospitals and the public health department didn't seem to be getting those broadcasted messages and there was a lot of confusion so we felt very operationally building an infrastructure of secure information confidence in the data so that we could when people asked and called we had the answers for them at least the answers of today um, and uh, we did see surges early on when and especially when U of O opened up um, school and uh, then again, a little bit in spring break, but overall we've had uh, you know lower rates. What's been exciting is the fact that now when people call saying, hey, can I get a COVID vaccine? We have been given vaccines by, and we work closely with Lane County Public Health. And because operationally we had the infrastructure, we had volunteer staff mm -hmm. sign up, we've been able to get people on the fly to come and get their COVID vaccines. I had a, a really cool story just the other day. I mean, these stories happen every day, but this particular one where a woman had been in and out of the hospital at the local hospital, and, and uh, I was seeing her virtually for a follow-up hospital visit, and I just happened to ask, did you by any chance get your COVID vaccine? And she said, no, but I really am looking for that. And uh, we have a message chat within our clinic uh, where we track how many vaccines we have left for the day in case there were no shows for vaccines. And she said, I also have three other people I live with. Can they get the vaccine? I quickly chatted to my team who said, yeah, we got, we got four vaccines, have her come in. And we real time were able to vaccinate her. And we were secure about what we were giving, the message we were giving, she felt safe. Um, and we had the staff to do it. And we used uh, Lane County's uh, you know, vaccines that they had given us, the Moderna vaccines to work together. So I feel that my organization, while they gave me the information, the tools, they also allowed me to good, be good neighbors and good stewards of the vaccine um, for that particular case. Thank you. Yeah, it's been very different, I think, with supply and demand in different part of the states. And, you know, as we, we've we made progress everywhere, as Dr. Deconis was talking about, I think you mentioned 42% overall. Um, but with the limited vaccine supply in some areas, I don't know that we have a true understanding of the level of vaccine hesitancy that we're going to see. So as the supply catches up with the demand, I think that will be a, a bigger piece of it. And then as you mentioned, we're starting to see a little bit more uh, COVID cases, although it, having that context around the surge really helped me. So Dr. Deconis, can you speak to, you know, what should we be doing as far as building confidence in the vaccine so that we can control the virus as the supply catches up to demand? Well, I, I would start with uh, individual empowerment. So there's a lot of false narrative out there, a lot of myth busting. So if everybody just went to the CDC website, for one thing, where they can get reliable um, 
information. I would start there. I do monitor the uh, you, what you need to know uh, page that they have for the public, and it's very readable. It's understandable. Obviously, for some of the populations that we worry about, it's the uh, the language barrier in terms of understanding some of this. So in, in addition to the individual empowerment to get the correct, reliable information and go to those reliable sources, then it's up to us to also help our community members translating some of these, you know, obviously, uh, if not obviously, but if you are interacting with us within KP, we have resources to, to uh, interpreters and such who, who can help uh, also translate, but you know, really calling on to to investing in some public service announcements, which I know in some communities in certain states are beginning to increase in terms of engagement and and really having familiar faces, not not just you know um, musicians or actors, but really someone that I can relate to. I'm I'm seeing myself in some of these announcements, and so. So it takes the individual, it takes communities, and it takes us pooling resources together to to help get the education out there and, and the truth, frankly. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, you know, I know another part that we are working on is to try to help overcome some of the historical concerns um, for some of the vulnerable populations with the medical community interactions. So to your point, seeing themselves and getting messaging that they that resonates with people. Um, and that includes everything from in the clinic or in the big events, but also then smaller events that we've been focusing on key vulnerable populations. Um, right. Dr. Bachman, have you had any interactions with your members? Any thoughts there around conversations that you've had when you're actually in clinic uh, that people have questions of vaccines that you've helped to build that confidence? Yeah, that's certainly happening all the time and certainly checking in with my patients as they come in. Have they been vaccinated? What are their concerns about vaccination? I think it's um, I would say people who are most anxious about vaccinations, who've met the criteria for vaccinations in Oregon over the last few weeks, have gotten those vaccinations. So there were lots mm -hmm. of heat and tension and concerns and anxiety before people get vaccinated. How long was it going to be? And now people that have been motivated and have been pursuing the vaccination, made a few phone calls, gotten the website. Really, essentially, all those folks have been vaccinated or in the process of being vaccinated. So then it comes to people who haven't been vaccinated yet and don't have a plan. So that's how I start. Do you have a plan? Somewhere along the way, make a strong message that we know that the benefits of vaccination clearly outweigh the risk. But it's important to be empathic and understand we don't know every. These are new vaccines. This is a new disease. We don't know everything. So starting where people are at and providing tailored information about their risks uh, is really important. And then, the, then it's helping them with a path. What do I need to do? These are people, these are the folks now who haven't gotten the first message or have chosen not to take mm -hmm. advantage of the first message. So really a clear path, whether it's call 211, go on the Kaiser Permanente website, go on the OHA website uh, to get that vaccination. And people are getting the vaccine through lots of different ways right now. Many at the OCC, many prefer the drive through at OHSU out at the airport, uh, and then at the retail pharmacies, people like that as well. It's almost been a good experience for everybody who's gotten it uh, with the relief of that anxiety. Um, so yeah, it's having those conversations, tailoring them to the individual's risk, understanding and being em empathizing. This isn't an easy decision. There are things that we don't know, uh, but being clear that the benefits clearly outweigh the risks. Thank you, Dr. Bachman. And just to translate, OCC is the Oregon Convention Center, um, where we have the mass vax for the quad area in Portland Metro. Okay. Let's move on to, we've been talking about building confidence there. So let's talk about some um, tools to build confidence. Keith, would you like to take this one? Yeah, happy to Jennifer. So, you know, what we've just seen is a sharing of a lot of very valuable information. And it is, as you mentioned, it's changing uh, frequently. So I really wanna remind everyone of a key resource. Uh, first, the questions, and the needs that emerge from you as employers or brokers and consultants and the members that we serve evolve in a shift over time. And we can all see that over the last year. And it's really required 
Kaiser Permanente and Kaiser Permanente Northwest to frequently update the resources or to provide links, as we mentioned before, directly to the CDC mm -hmm. because it is so dynamic. So to that end, I just wanna remind you um, of the currently available flyers that we have for employees and we'll routinely, routinely update these. And they're in what we call our playbook. And it's at kp.org forward slash choose better. And so we've learned over the past year that returning to normal isn't this straight path, right, Jennifer? It's really been a, a curvy at times or maybe just a sharp turns. And because of that, we've launched this playbook and we're actually into our 11th edition. So it's probably more than every month or so. So if you haven't looked at it lately, you'll wanna revisit it and mark it so that if there's something you need, this is a very reliable evidence-based place to find information. And if you're not familiar with where this is, I encourage you to just contact your account manager and they can help you with that. Um, so I just wanted to make a, a plug for that, Jennifer. I think it's, we found it to be very valuable and got great feedback on it. So it, it's a, a, a credible resource. Yeah, thank you, Keith. You know, the great thing, I mean, our integrated model, we talk about a lot. We'll talk about how it allowed us to pivot care, and we'll talk about how the cost, um, we were able to implement cost saving measures to offset just the waves of new expenses that have come through with the pandemic. But I think more importantly for this topic is that the integrated model gives us a perspective of being an employer that has an incredibly varied work place. So whether they're people in the clinic or the admin folks, you know, we have people working in all sorts of locations. And it's that experience that is also brought to bear in these resources. So hopefully you can take a look at it and you'll find something that helps you as you support your work. So let's pivot back to the conversation as we start to think about the remainder of 2021 and we look forward to 2022. So Dr. DeConis, we'll come back to you. Uh, we've talked a lot about increased telehealth over the past year, but can you talk a bit about how we were able to leverage telehealth technology to leverage our members' needs during the pandemic and get us ready for that future? Yeah, you know, um... I was part of the team when we had to respond to and plan for Ebola. And I never thought that I'd be part of yet another team to be uh, planning for a pandemic, you know, with the last one being over a hundred years ago. So, so prior to the pandemic, we had stood up e-visits where you go to your app or kp.org, answer questions, and it gives you a curated recommend, set of recommendations to take care of your health needs, in addition to you know, getting you appointed if need be. So we, we had that beforehand. We've been doing phone appointments you know, over 20 years. Um, we had email. So, so we had those modalities going in. Video visit was something that we'd started close to three years also before the pandemic. So we were fortunate that as we were investing in these capabilities, uh, we already had the tools. And so when the pandemic hit, we were able to pivot to that. And I think with some of you who've attended some of these speak speaker series before, I shared, for example, that um, for any given week in March and April of last year, we had anywhere from 50 to 60,000 emails and, and phones that continued and uh, enabled the care to be continued, particularly with our patients with chronic conditions and those with acute needs. So we, we had those capabilities. During the pandemic, we also then stood up video on demand so that if you had an acute need, but for many reasons with, with uh, limitations in going to a brick and mortar facility, we were able to stand up urgent care video on demand um, for our patients and members. So that was another way to supplement the brick and mortar uh, visits that just simply were not available during the early days. And, and now we have even more of it. And lastly, uh, we have stood up our third hospital uh, in KP Northwest that you may or may not be aware of with the CMS waiver that came out with Hospitals Without Walls. We will actually be celebrating the one year anniversary of our KP Hospital at Home, we call it simply KP at Home, 
this Thursday. And to date, we have admitted uh, about 470 patients to our virtual hospital um, since standing it up almost a year ago now using the CMS waiver. So these are just some of the building on capabilities that we've been standing up all along pre-pandemic and then just accelerated during the pandemic in addition to new other service lines and services that having the tools uh, ready and, and having this um, one medical group, one electronic health record, uh, all of that systemness, we were we were able to do so. So just Thank few examples. You. Yeah, that's a great base, and we'll continue to build upon that as we go through. Um, as Keith mentioned, the winding road, we're going to take a little bit of a um, turn here and start to talk about research and the work on the vaccine before we leave that too far. So, um, Dr. Nalloway, we talked earlier about vaccine hesitancy and how to support education and improve uptake, but I think I speak for many of us when and I say that, you know, prior to COVID-19, I never really thought about the vaccine research and whether it was safe and effective and how, it, you know, how effective it was. I just showed up and got my vaccine. But now I have a bunch of information coming towards me um, and I'm supposed to somehow evaluate that like an epidemiologist. So you've been preparing for this, though, your entire career. Um, so can you talk about the role that research research and the work you've been doing has played in managing the pandemic really from the very beginning and with vaccine development. Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. And you're right. As an infectious disease epidemiologist, I have been training. I have been trained and doing this for all my life, but I have to say, I don't think I ever expected it to be this this horrible <laughs> and and this exhausting and this just it just seems to be going on forever and ever but let me step back to the beginning of the pandemic and we'll talk a little bit about how research has supported the care that we give at Kaiser um, and also uh, the information that we're providing to public health and to the CDC and even up to the White House as we try to manage this uh, pandemic not only at a local level but at a national and now international level. So as Jennifer said, we were involved um, in this pandemic from the very beginning. One of my colleagues, another infectious disease epidemiologist that we have at the Center for Health Research back in January in 2020 was starting to get a little worried about some data that was coming out of China. And he raised the alarm bells pretty early on this and said, you know, I think this is, this is it, this is gonna be a big one and we need to get ready. And so in partnership with um, some of us at the Center for Health Research and some of our providers and health plan and some other local public health teams, um, we formed a team um, to do some mathematical modeling and forecasting and so we were ready. Um, we wanted to see, you know, what can we expect in terms of patients coming into our hospitals? How many ICU beds do we have? How many ventilators do we have? Do we have that personal protective equipment that our employees are going to need to provide care for patients and keep themselves safe? And the good news is we did a really good job with that here at Kaiser. Um, we were prepared. We had data to inform our decisions. And a lot of that was driven by some really complicated math um, that we did at the Center for Health Research. And so we were right there in partnership with our providers from the beginning. And we continued on with that work. Again, I think the story that you've heard throughout this presentation so far is that things are very dynamic and you're constantly pivoting when it comes to COVID. Um, so our first case, we had, um, I guess, the fortune and misfortune of having the first Oregon case come into Westside Hospital and, and be hospitalized there in March, 2020. And at that time, we really didn't know how to take care of COVID patients in the hospital. We'd never seen this disease before. And there was a lot of interest among our provider teams, especially our infectious disease and ICU doctors, like how are we gonna care for these patients? And so we formed another nice partnership, which is again, a theme that you're gonna hear. We're integrated and we partner with each other a lot. 
Um, we formed this nice partnership between some of our hospital providers, our pharmacists, our laboratory um, technicians, and then our clinical trials team at the Center for Health Research to really almost immediately bring in some COVID treatment trials that we could offer to our patients who are hospitalized in our facilities. Um, so we have a long standing history, as Jennifer said, about doing vaccine safety and effectiveness research. We also have a long standing, standing history of doing clinical trials research. So we're very well known to places like the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control. So pretty much right away, we got involved in a large National Institutes of Health trial um, of remdesivir, which is an antiviral agent. And we were offering that to um, people who are hospitalized in our facilities. And that agent was shown to have some effect. It does um, reduce the likelihood of being um, um, moved into the ICU and also helps shorten the length of stay for hospitalized patients. And that trial network has kind of expanded over time as the pandemic has changed. So we've done a trial of remdesivir, as I said, and then we started a trial looking at remdesivir and an immunomodulating drug called verisinitumab. That's a hard word, but I, I said it right. Um, so <laughs> we wouldn't also, have known if you didn't is the yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah, it's, right? it's a big word. Um, so we've been doing that, those trials as well. And we continue to offer um, trials to our patients through this NIH network. So now I'm going to pivot to the work that we've been doing in vaccine safety and effectiveness and also vaccine trials. And this is where almost all of my research has focused and probably why I look so exhausted today and why I have no time for hobbies, as Jennifer mentioned. It's just been a, a long, a long road. Um, so as, as some of you might have heard, um, our partners, our Kaiser Permanente partners to the north, our Washington group, they were the very first in the nation to start up a vaccine trial. So they were the first to put shots in arms. Um, they were awarded the, the Moderna vaccine trial through NIH. And shortly after they did that, we started up a trial with Pfizer. So we were using the Pfizer mRNA product and offered that to patients coming into the Center for Health Research. Um, we started up that trial, I believe, in July. Um, I'm kind of losing track of time because it's been kind of a blur about how fast things have moved, but we were quickly able to enroll patients into this trial um, because we have a really strong um, infrastructure for doing these trials and supporting vaccine research. So we got these people enrolled, we did all the follow-up with them, and then as everyone knows, um, both the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer's and the Moderna vaccines were granted emergency use authorization um, in December of 2020. So that is just remarkable. I think we all feel very proud um, to have contributed to those, uh, those trials and getting those vaccines um, out to the public. But our work has not stopped there. <laughs> so um, now we are very actively involved in monitoring vaccine safety and effectiveness. Um, one paper that I recently published was the CDC and the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report um, was just featured a couple weeks ago in a White House briefing. Um, basically, that paper showed that either of the mRNA vaccine products were over 90% effective against preventing SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that was um, from a large study that we've been doing um, that has enrolled healthcare providers. So about 400 of our own employees joined this trial to participate in it with us. Um, it not only involves healthcare personnel, but we've enrolled first responders and we've also reached out and enrolled other essential um, frontline workers. So these are people that are out there working and supporting our economy and also are putting themselves at risk of SARS-CoV infection, SARS-CoV-2 infection because of the jobs that they do. So we're delighted to say that we've seen that the vaccine is very effective um, in this real world setting. And we have so many more papers to come out of this uh, project. You'll probably be seeing one next week. So um, this is just an example of how our research is hopefully um, providing some evidence that our providers can use to help have conversations about vaccine hesitancy. And then finally, I'll say a big chunk of research that we do is uh, vaccine safety work. And we have a long standing project called the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which I lead here in the Northwest region. It's a partnership with the CDC that's been in existence 
since 1990. And normally we do our research relatively quietly in the background and just say we find do all these studies that generally say that vaccines are safe. Um, but as you know, we've quickly come to the forefront um, with all of the concerns around the blood clots so the Johnson and Johnson vaccine um, during that one week pause um, that the CDC and FDA put on the vaccine. Both of those agencies came to us here at Kaiser Permanente and said, what is going on? Can you tell us what's going on? What are you seeing in your data? And we very quickly with many sleepless nights um, put together a report for them. Um, that was presented last Friday at the Advisory Committee on Immunizations Practices meeting. Um, so we've had about 142,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson administered throughout the Kaiser system. And we looked and we could not find any cases of these specialized blood clots, this uh, thrombocytopenic, or thrombosis with thrombocytopenic syndrome. It's, it's a new term, so still trying to get used to the naming on that. Um, but that was really reassuring. And we went beyond that and just and started investigating any types of blood clots and did not see anything, um, again, with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and nor did we find anything with the two mRNA vaccines in our data. So this is a really great example of um, how we in research um, can use the massive power of the Kaiser Permanente electronic medical records data to really quickly answer some of these important and critical public health and policy questions. Um, so we have been there all along through this pandemic and I have no doubt that I am not done yet, <laughs> that we are not done yet with the research. So we will be continuing to monitor vaccine and safety, safety and effectiveness as we go forward. Thank you. And I think this brings up a good point and a question that we were receiving from the audience that I'll ask Dr. Dakonas uh, maybe to comment on. And then uh, Dr. Nalloway, if you have anything you'd like to add there. And that is about the variants. So we're seeing the vaccine mute, I'm sorry, we're seeing the virus mutate. And so people are asking, you know, will this vaccine remain effective? What's that going to look like? Um, you know, can we, is that some of the reluctance for people to get the vaccine? So maybe we can just talk a little bit about the virus mutation and its interplay with the vaccinations. Dr. Dakota. Yeah, I, doc, doc, yeah, Dr. Nalloway is, is obviously this is what she spends her life uh, doing. So uh, we'll go to her uh, momentarily. You know, in terms of the, the variants, first of all, what um, we're reading about, particularly from some of the trials, is that the fact that the UK variant is now predominant is keeping some of the other variants at bay, number one. The second thing is that the, the vaccines are effective, you know, particularly the, the two ones that Moderna and Pfizer that we have, and you know, even the uh, AstraZeneca and uh, Sputnik, Novavax, other vaccines you haven't heard of, there are uh, studies too ongoing that show they're also effective uh, against the variants. And, and I, I think this is where semantics matters too, when people, when, when researchers are using the terms clinical you know, efficacy, and we lay people try to interpret it what we think efficacy means, and they're not the same. So, mm -hmm. so, and lastly, when you hear about uh, lab test results about antibodies or neutralizing antibodies, recall that when you get a vaccine, the human body actually makes many, many, many thousands of antibodies against the virus. So if you're in a lab testing it against a set or a narrow set of antibodies. In reality, in the human body, it's many, many more. Plus, you also have immune cells. So our, our immune response is not confined to just the production of a set of antibodies. It's many, many. Plus, you've got immune cells also battling. So the totality of the actual human body response to a vaccine is so much more comprehensive. It's so much more nuanced that when you read about, well, in the lab, this showed this and that. So, so we, have to, we have to hold all those complex concepts in our heads. And so our job then is to simplify that to say to the public, these vaccines are effective. They're effective against the variants. 
and have a shot in your arm because what we're really looking at is we're preventing death with them and we're preventing hospitalizations with them. And ultimately the battle in this pandemic is to get it to a point where it's a cold. You get the cold, you get the COVID-19 cold. That, that's the ultimate aim. We're not gonna eradicate this thing, but we're gonna get it to a point where we've gotten the influenza or probably even better. So Dr. Nalloway. Well, thank you. That was that was very well said. I would just add that um, we definitely are addressing the variant issue in our research. So we will continue to follow all of our cohorts to look at to, uh, to look at vaccine effectiveness against variants. And we also have a clinical trial that we're running right now at the Center for Health Research uh, with Pfizer um, that is testing a product that they have designed specifically to address the South African variant. So we do have that trial going on right now, as well as a trial um, with Pfizer looking at a booster dose. Um, so I think we probably are looking at booster doses um, in the not too distant future. And so I think we'll probably, as Dr. Dakona said, we're gonna be living with coronavirus now and hopefully it becomes like a, a cold. And I think our vaccination will largely end up being more uh, consistent with what we do for the flu where you'll probably get a coronavirus vaccination every year or so. Yeah, I would say one thing is that people are pretty used to the idea of uh, bacteria and antibiotics and quick development of antibiotic resistance. And they're concerned that, that this vaccination will act the same way. So I would say, well, it's not the same analogy. The way bacteria's, bacteria and resistance patterns come in is not the same. We don't see in practice for the other places that we use immunizations against viruses. We don't see development of resistance and where the variants come about is when there's virus circulating in the community. So if we see unchecked viral circulation, in, in, that's where we're gonna see more variants develop. So really the vaccine will help prevent the development of variants more than cause variants to occur. Thank you, Dr. Bachman. One question that um, came in is, do people who have had COVID-19 need to get the vaccine? And I think that relates to um, the creation of antibodies. And I know I've heard the answer is yes, but Dr. Bachman, would you like to add anything there? Uh, yeah, just that it's not, it's counterintuitive, but you get more protective antibodies than you do from a case of COVID, uh, particularly a mild case of COVID. So that's where the recommendation mm -hmm. is. Please even if you've had COVID, get the vaccination. Thank you. If somebody else could add to that much better, I'm sure. That's perfect. Okay. okay. So maybe we could switch gears just a little bit. So we've been talking about um, research and the work that you've been doing around the pandemic, but the Center for Health Research has been in place for decades and near and dear to my heart is the reason we have a dental program. So as Keith mentioned, you know, dental's my baby. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, how research and innovation um, has changed care just in generally in general and what that will look like as we continue to try to move forward to make it more affordable and more convenient and really focus on quality. Yeah, um, so the Center for Health Research has been around. Uh, we've been around since 1964. We started out as a really small group of researchers and we've now grown to have about 240 employees and we have about 40 scientists um, across a variety of disciplines. So I work with people who are medical anthropologists, uh, psychologists, health economic, health economic, I can't say <laughs> health economists is the word I'm going for. Um, and so there's some people like me, epidemiologists who work at, at CHR as well. And um, we actually have a, a really good reputation nationally and internationally. We're out there competing for grant funding um, from the National Institutes of Health, from the Centers for Disease Control, um, from pharmaceutical companies. So we're very much like a university like that where we're doing very innovative research um, that's funded um, largely by federal sources. Um, 
we value our partnership so much with the health plan. Um, it allows us to work with real patients and conduct our research with our providers and work within um, the great infrastructure that we have within the health plan and the delivery system. And I think without those resources, we wouldn't be able to do the high quality research that we do. And I would also give a plug for just the rich amount of, of electronic medical records data um, that we can access to do our research to. It's, it's really the envy of, of all people, around the, all researchers around the world. Um, our center is led by Dr. Lucy Savitz, who is one of the nation's le leading experts in what's called the learning health system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second and give you some um, concrete examples of what that means and the types of projects that we can do um, within that framework. Um, just overall, I'll, a few of the highlights of research that we've done um, in the decades that we've been around. Um, one, one project that we had, we looked at methods to help overweight and obese pregnant women maintain a healthy weight during pregnancy and help ensure that their babies were healthy. That was a very important project that we did. Um, we've also demonstrated that we can do colo, uh, colon cancer screenings by mail and that's acceptable to patients. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, another interesting project that we did was um, we provided service dogs to veterans and we found that those service dogs really helped them manage um, some of their post-traumatic stress disorder. So our research is very varied, um, but usually very impactful as well. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this, this learning health system and what that means. Um, basically a learning health system is where you try to bring evidence-based practices into clinical care. And you don't just bring them in and, and do it. There's a whole framework that goes around it. You wanna make sure that those um, practices and interventions that you're doing really work, that they're impactful, that they make a difference, that they improve patient outcomes, that patients are satisfied with them, that they're feasible for providers to implement and that providers are satisfied with them. Um, you also wanna know, do they save money? Or do they help improve efficiency? So. This learning health system is really just kind of a big experiment that we're doing where we try to bring in different programs quickly, get our providers up to speed, get them rolled out to patients and make sure that they work and, and make sure that we're testing that. Um, so I'll talk about two projects that have come out of the learning health system. And one of these projects is the medical dental integration project. And this, I'm, it's kind of silly to call it a project because it's really just a big, huge thing and it's more of a, a mindset. Um, we are so fortunate in the Northwest region that we provide not only medical care to our members, but also dental care. And that means that we're a really unique place. I think there's only two other groups in this country that um, offer these types of um, care packages to people. And it's, it's really nice because we can work with our, our medical providers and our dental providers can work together. And I think that the catchphrase that we use is to provide total health care. Um, you know, your mouth doesn't separate from separate from your body. So we, we shouldn't be treating it as such as you're one person, right? And so our medical and dental providers can communicate with each other. They share a common electronic medical record. Um, oftentimes our providers are housed in the same actual clinic building so they can have good communications there. Um, we've been doing projects where we will send nurses into our dental clinics so they're right there to provide care for patients. And the medical dental integration project that I'll talk about was one that was designed to close care gaps. And we're gonna hear some more about that later. And what I mean by that is a gap, a care gap is when someone is due for a preventive care service. So maybe they need a cancer screening like colonoscopy or mammography. Um, maybe they need a vaccination. Maybe they need to have their cholesterol checked or have their blood pressure checked. So we can look into the medical record system and it will say this person, this patient that you have before you today has a care gap. And this medical dental integration project is using our dental providers to help us close those gaps. So it may be that a dentist just has that conversation with a patient and says, hey, are you aware that you know, you're due for a mammography? Um, it may be that one of our dental care providers takes a patient over to membership services or takes them down to the nurse treatment room, 
and says, hey, you know, this patient's due for a vaccine today. Can we, can, can we help them get that? Um, and sometimes, um, especially around flu shot time, you may be sitting in the dental chair and your dental provider will say, it looks like you're due for a flu shot today. And they just send a little chat message over to the nurse and the nurse comes right over with the vaccine and you, you're vaccinated right there in the dental chair. Um, so this is a really unique service that we provide and we wanted to see if it helped close some of these care gaps. And so one of my colleagues just published a paper not too long ago showing that indeed it does help close care gaps. So our members who have both medical and dental coverage with us, we're much more likely to have these care gaps closed than people who are just coming to us for medical care alone. So um, that's one example of how this learning health system works and how our integrated model um, really provides good care and how we can evaluate that and research and, and show you the actual numbers around that. Um, the other one that I'll talk about today is a medically tailored meals project. And this um, project was really focused on older adults who have been recently discharged from the hospital. And it's people who have chronic medical conditions like cancer or maybe chronic kidney disease, um, heart failure, diabetes, cirrhosis, COPD, some of those big important um, chronic diseases. And you know, when you get discharged from the hospital, you still have a lot of recovery to do at home. And a big part of this is just trying to, to eat and keep yourself nourished so you can recover well when you're at home. And that's a real challenge for a lot of people, especially older adults. And so this medically tailored meals program is a partnership with our providers, the health plan, and also a bunch of community partners. And we actually bring meals to these patients um, after they're discharged from the hospital, we bring them to their homes. We're also feeding household members um, that may also have some needs. And the most important thing is we're trying to make sure that they are getting meals that are healthy for them. And also if they're discharged from the hospital and they have special dietary restrictions, like maybe they need a low salt diet or maybe they need a high calorie diet, um, we can make sure that they are getting those, the food that they need and that it's convenient for them and that will give them a chance to, to nourish their bodies and, and get better faster. Thank I'll you. Turn it back to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's incredibly important. I remember, you know, any when my grandma was in the hospital, my grandfather would have eaten hot dogs, the only thing he knew how to cook for, you know, three weeks straight, if that's uh, without any, any support, so. Um, Bef we're going to next move into innovation and technology in the regular care organization. But before we do that, we have a question that has come in that I think really will leverage the power of the data that we're talking about across all KP regions. So over 12 million members with their data collection. And this is about long haulers. So we hear about the impacts of COVID-19, the people that are experiencing longer uh, issues from the disease, and really just, I would say, long-term effects of any of this, since this is a new virus, we don't have it. Um, is there any tracking that goes on or any conversation that we could have around long haulers and what that might look like? And uh, both Dr. Dakotis and Dr. Nalloway, I would uh, welcome your uh, input if you have any there. Yeah, so, you know, since the start of the pandemic and, and really before, we've always had interregional chiefs of various departments working. So our chiefs of infectious disease have been meeting regularly uh, pre-pandemic, but certainly even more so since the pandemic started. And one of the things that have come up uh, several months ago now is, you know, we're seeing patients with persistent symptoms and really a syndrome. It's a collection of symptoms that persist even after they've recovered from the acute symptoms of COVID-19 illness. So. Um, it's a multidisciplinary team that we're building uh, across KP and the, all the Permanente Medical Groups are creating a cohort of leads. So in the Northwest, Dr. Ellen Singer, who's also our uh, Director of uh, Graduate and Undergraduate Medical um, Education, is, is leading a, a, a team of other um, specialty physicians because you know, a lot of these patients, as you might imagine, present to primary care 
but then really having cardiologists, pulmonologists, neurologists, a multidisciplinary team, and then connecting that across the various clinical teams in KP Nation, because we do have the power of the big data, right, as we continue to follow the patients. And, um, and then also getting to a, a, not just a cohort and understanding that cohort of patients, but then what do, how do we help them? And, and what are some of those uh, resources that we can either share across our regions, but also under, begin to understand what works, what doesn't work. And, and, you know, right now with the cohort of patients that we are sharing uh, information across the medical groups, it's patients who need a, a lot of support, um, you know, uh, certainly mental health, but also physical health for those who are expect, you know, experiencing chronic fatigue or, or just not being able to sustain the physical health and the physical activities that they were able to sustain before. So it, it, it is definitely a multidisciplinary approach. Thank you. Dr. Nalloway, would you like to add anything before we move to the next section? No, that was a great summary. We're, we're hoping to get a National Institutes of Health grant to, to study this across Kaiser region. So we'll, we'll know in a couple of weeks if we get that or not. Yeah, I would think that'd be very important. We hear that at each one of these we do, there have been questions around, you know, long haulers and, and really just long term anything since we haven't yet mm -hmm. gotten to the long term, right? Well, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And now, uh, Dr. Bachman and Dr. Gensale, I would like to talk a little bit about the on-the-ground experience in care delivery. So Dr. Nalloway has been talking about the research and, and the work she's doing, and uh, Dr. Deconis has been talking about really leading um, the system and what that might look like. But you've been on the ground treating patients since day one of this pandemic. And so, so would you give us your experience and talk about how care has changed and really what do you anticipate the future to look like? Because we know it's not going to be what it was in 2019, right? Right. I, um, I, you're absolutely right. And just as we've had to navigate all this new information, we've had to navigate how we take care of patients and re-engineer that. And what we've found is that there's a lot we can do without having to bring the person in person for a visit. And uh, we're operationally changing to what video visits look like. So when members join, we have medical assistants that actually can help them with the tech part of it and tee up their visit, set up their preventative care you know, reminders so that when I enter the video, I'm really able to listen to the member, to them as to what matters most to them, uh, while all the other bells and whistles that our technology has enabled me to do to take care of them preventatively has already been done. So there's a lot of uh, great uh, things about virtual visit and a story, story I'll just share. Um, it was a police officer, a young woman who was feeling very ill and couldn't find daycare to come into the office for an exam. And she got on a video visit. She was helped with that by our virtual roomer who you know, asked her, teed up her meds and her, said, yes, this, you need this immunization too. I got on, I could tell she was feeling pretty ill and her two rambunctious toddlers were in the background, not giving her a break. And uh, we were able to make a connection. I was able to diagnose her, give her a medication and do a same day delivery to her door along with a work um, note uh, for her employers. And she did. we did that all within 20 minutes, her on her couch and me at home. And uh, it saved her a lot of time, money, hassle and childcare. Yeah, I've been amazed in the times when I've done video visits for things that I wouldn't have thought could have been done by video um, in the past. It really, it really has changed and it's so convenient. Dr. Bachman, I know that you are um, practicing regularly and you have video schedules. Would you like to, to chime in here? Yeah, I think, I, I think we're getting better at doing the video visits, learning how to do an exam uh, via video. I think our physical therapists are doing a fabulous job, and I, my patients have generally been delighted with the virtual physical therapy um, and felt that they really got what they needed out of it. Um, I think the conversation is really headed 
not that virtual or video or telephone is a substitute for an office visit, but really what's the best way to meet an individual's need for that problem on that day. So rather than the default being an office visit, the default really should be what's the best way to reach it. And as people are more comfortable doing video visits and phone visits, and this has really pushed it and doing a lot of their work from home via Zoom, um, just getting more comfortable with that. I don't think we'll ever go back to where we were with an office visit being the default uh, for it. Yeah, thank you for that. I know when we're looking at, you'll see some information in the next slide about what is what does that look like? How frequently can we help uh, the member with what they need with a video visit? And then how that really translates um, to both the care experience that Dr. Taconis can speak to, but then the employer experience that uh, Keith was so focused on. So uh, Dr. Taconis, would you like to talk about that, what we've actually seen now that we are doing so many more video visits? We're continuing to learn, Jennifer, uh, as you, you know, do you think about the previous 12 months, uh, taking a, a very special, really narrow timeline of experience and then extrapolating that to what should we expect moving forward, you know, learning a lot, for example, of for those who use e-visit, what's the bounce back rate? How many then end up needing another visit, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, when they use e-visit or when they use a video visit, how many are needing to, uh, so those are the things that we are tracking, uh, we like data in KP, so uh, those are the things that continue to help inform us. And it's really building the artificial intelligence capability, um, and, and that's coming soon um, in, in KP around knitting the AI-enabled natural language processing thing so that when you get on this and you put in your symptoms, the or the intelligence behind it is to Dr. Bachman's point, going to help you curate about, you know, we recommend this, but here are your other options to, be, to getting care. And so really we have, that, we have that technology now, we will be implementing that. And then, and then for across KP, being able to balance load where the access is. So, cause you know, with, with video and such, you don't have to be in the medical office building that the patient typically goes to to support the patient. Um, I, I think we were going to talk about mental health too. Um, and, and maybe if we go to that slide, I, maybe I, I use that as a particular case study for um, mental health. And, you know, the pandemic has brought increased depression and anxiety. Um, as well, substance use and substance use disorder, alcoholism. I think those of you who have attended these before, I mentioned over 270% increase in online sales of alcohol. Um, in some studies uh, where they've surveyed adults, you know, over 40% have said it's adversely impacted their mental health. And for young adults, 18 to 30, 75% reported that. And so, so what's changed and how is technology and innovation enabling this? Let's start with digital therapeutics. So uh, for those for whom it's appropriate, using an app like Calm or My Strength have been very helpful. The other thing is that we, before the pandemic, we instituted our strategy around behavioral health consultants. So really embedding them in primary care where most patients the vast majority of patients present with mental health uh, concerns. And with that in play now, over 50% reduction in the need for their care escalating to needing a mental health therapist or a psychiatrist. So, so we know early intervention works. And as our medical director for mental health would tell us, skills over pills. So that's been um, a, a very important uh, add to our strategy in, in mental health. The other thing is peer support. So uh, those with mental health um, concerns with addiction, having a peer that can help them, support them through their journey has also evidence-based uh, intervention that we've layered on. And then um, lastly, TMS. So 
So this is a transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's performed by a procedural psychiatrist. We were in the first in the state to offer this service. And it's where magnetic fields are used to really stimulate nerve cells in the brain to improve symptoms of depression, particularly in patients who have not responded to the typical uh, treatment. So, so we've scaled that up. We've also taught other colleagues now in all the other medical groups in Kaiser Permanente Nation. And we have the largest data set of patients that we've been tracking. Uh, we've published this, we've presented our data in world conferences. So those are the kind of things that both the technology using the science and again, using our big data um, has helped us to iterate and innovate these care models in, in mental health and addiction medicine. Uh, Jennifer, I was gonna just uh, jump in because I thought, you know, this is an area where we, um, we see a tremendous opportunity, I think, working with employers and others about changing the kind of the, uh, the default of patients to say, how do I seek care, right? So we mm -hmm. want to do this in a way, and our clinicians will message that, um, but it is really changing um, the expectation and then the behavior, which takes a while. But however, we could work yeah. with employers and others to do that so they see it really as a convenience, because that's what we're trying to do, you know, again, to that triple aim, maintain or improve quality, um, make the service easier so you don't have to drive to an office, don't have to get out of the car, take care of your, the kids if you have those, and then, you know, and then go in and see the clinician. If you could do it in the convenience of your home, whether it be behavioral health or just uh, physical health, um, it could help us all. And we really want to make sure that we change this behavior in a way that the patient sees it as a real benefit to them because it is. So it's just an area of partnership I think we can have with employers. Yeah, I agree, Keith. And there's there's a key piece of that as well in, you know, if you aren't working from home, so there's plenty of uh, people on the front line and in essential jobs where you know, they don't have the luxury of staying home, but often our employment systems only account for those in face or face to face visits right so people will have the opportunity to take off half a day to go to a visit but they don't have the employee protections to have one hour for a visit yeah. so it's rethinking right. even those structural pieces of our employment our care etc and working together to align those into a more efficient effective uh, system because we're all trying to transform healthcare, whether it's personally, professionally, or you know, as a customer. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about. So, Dr. Nalloway had talked a lot about care gaps. Had talked about the different uh, ways that we're trying to fill those. I mean, it's been a year now that we've been on some version of lockdown. Some people are now, you know, school teachers in their homes that they never had to be before. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that people are have not necessarily kept up with their own health. So uh, Dr. Ginselli, can you talk a little bit about some situations, how you talk with your patients and how we're trying to um, get people to stay on top of their health or really catch up after this uh, pandemic situation? Yeah, thanks. I, I find that people are holding off a lot, of course, on their preventative care gaps. A lot of them had to come in physically for immunizations um, to get their FID card mailed or to just get blood drawn for their chronic care gaps to be closed. But uh, so again, our technology kind of pings me when I have the screen open and I'm really trying to listen to what matters to the patient. I'm reminded of those preventative care gaps. And in Eugene's office, we've got these big screens on the wall where I actually bring up their chart for them to watch what I'm doing. And they see the red flags of the preventative uh, gaps and they it's a visual reminder to some of them. Uh, and there's a lot more buy-in when they actually see it on the, on the big screen like that. And, uh, you know, I'm able to uh, get those care and then have the data for, uh, uh, in our shared decision-making tools that we have uh, to collectively close those care gaps. 
And I think from the medical dental integration, I just have, you know, I have a bunch of stories because that's all I do every day, which is a joy to me. But I have one particular very touching story of, uh, you know, the medical dental integration, I think, is a team sport. I never had that where I worked in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But here having our dentists who are sharing in the chart and sharing in the uh, members care um, messaged us after a, a woman had really been quite depressed and actually she was struggling with just even cleaning her teeth, just basic um, care for her teeth. And, and they asked, well, why is that? And, and she said to them, you know, I, I'm just having a st struggling doing anything at this point. And it alerted them to sort of message us in a secure chat. Uh, hey, this person needs a behavioral health consultant. And much what Dr. DeConis mentioned, having a behavioral health consultant on site, which we do. We, we were messaged, we were able to get her connected with that behavioral health consultant who saw her immediately. Um, and so medical dental integration happened at the moment for mental health. And then on top of that, there's many stories. I, I've heard more than one where a, a dentist will say, hey, it looks like you're actually due for your mammogram. And someone had skipped maybe two, three years of getting their mammogram and this particular woman uh, got her mammogram, found she had you know, stage one cancer, but, but curable. But she still, to this day, will thank her dentist for finding her breast cancer. Um, you know, it's, it's stories like that that inspire me every day. I've never worked in an organiz organization that had that level of integration, again, with always focusing on the member first and making it a win for them. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bachman, would you like to um, talk about, you know, cancer screenings, what you're seeing there? I know you had mentioned some of the virtual services like physical therapy and, and things that we're doing for folks. But, you know, as we're talking about cancer screenings, that's a big one. We're hearing really throughout the community that cancer screenings are down. Yeah, it's a it's a complicated story. And looking at sort of the group numbers uh, from our large employer groups, we are seeing slight decreases. Now, we're starting at the highest possible levels, uh, Kaiser Permanente Northwest, some of the most other Kaiser regions really get top notch scores or top notch ability to get uh, members in for needed preventive services. And really during the first surge in March and April, Things were slowed down. There was a, there was shortages of PPE, which led to inability to do mammographies or come in for routine um, cervical cancer screening uh, or colonoscopies, uh, and so there was a reason those numbers have declined slightly. But they're not they're not declining as quickly as you would think, because for instance, you know, for three or four months gap. The, the cervical cancer screening is a five-year look back. So it's really just a small number of women who were missed. And once they come in, that will then, they will then be cut up for the next five years. We are seeing reductions in the colorectal cancer screening. We do really well in that measure compared to most healthcare systems because about half our members prefer to use the yearly FIT test, which is non-invasive uh, and easy to use. And that's just a one-year look back. So those numbers will decline pretty fast. And we did turn off, turn that off for a few months and people were distracted uh, during the early part of the pandemic. But those numbers are going to be coming back as well. So we think down the line, given the low positive numbers of tests we have for those. We have to test a lot of women to detect one case of breast cancer and a lot of uh, people to detect one case of colon cancer. Um, I believe we're not gonna be seeing large numbers of advanced cancers. I think we'll find more cancers detected over the next six months, uh, but they won't be advanced cancers. Now, there are gonna be some people who are still too anxious to come in or decided they really don't want to get screened. Maybe they are suffering uh, with behavioral health problems. And I think that's going to be a bigger challenge to get those people reconnected, re-engaged. Um, we're good at that. We know how to do it. We use multiple modalities, office visits, IVR, emails, phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think there will be some people that will not want to get, will not be easy to re-engage and we'll need to really make an effort to do that. And that's what our teams are currently doing now. Yeah, and that's an area I think that the account management teams can help support as well because we can work with workforce wellness, right? And so a lot of times some of those events are bringing on um, doing care gaps for employers, you know, different things like that and messaging that we can um, just add to that modality that you're talking about. So outside the clinical space, but wrapping around a person to um, support their total health. 
And I would say the, be the behavioral health is important too. And to really, as an employer, be thinking about behavioral health and how to destigmatize, how to encourage, how to get people into the treatment that they need. I think there's concern, there's has been increased alcohol use, uh, less exercise, which has an impact. Um, and then obviously higher rates of mental health disorders as well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bachman. Okay, so we have left time for our audience to ask questions of this distinguished panel. Uh, the first one that has come in is really about vaccine tracking. So um, it's on my phone. So I'm getting I'm getting multimedia myself. So please forgive me as I look down. Um, but someone has received both vaccines outside of Kaiser Permanente and in two different states. Um, can they call to verify if we have tracked the vaccines? And I'll start with uh, we do receive reporting from the states when your vaccine uh, that you've gotten your vaccine. It does depend on the state how often they report though. So I know we see a pretty significant difference between Washington and Oregon, which of course the two I'm most familiar with. Um, but I, I believe that we will receive them from all states. I see Dr. Nalloway, you're um, nodding your head. So any thoughts there? Yeah, I think, um... We definitely will get that data at some point in time. It just may take a little bit to come in. And I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I do believe you probably could also contact your primary care provider and work with them to get it entered as well. I think that's an option. Dr. Bachman, do you speak? Do you want to speak to that? Is that something you can assist with? Yeah, we, we will enter the data in, but we want to see the card to, before we do that just to make sure that it's really happened. But they're coming through electronically for the most part when we look mm -hmm. for it. Excellent. Okay, and then it looks like there's a question regarding cost savings. And, and I think that's probably really around telemedicine and uh, how that translates. And so I'll, I'll start a little bit with that and then, um, you know, ask for input there. You know, I think from a, we see cost in a real variety, show up in a variety of places when we're talking about healthcare and whether that's uh, a person who can stay at work Work because their health is improved and their attention span and all of that's improved, whether it's a person who is actually physically needing to leave for treatment or care or because they're experiencing something that takes them out of the workplace longer, um, that all has to be considered. Those are the maybe the unseen costs from the health plan side. Uh, there's the employee side, but depending on co-pays and deductibles and what, what they're experiencing from an actual care perspective perspective when they're receiving care and they have their health plan. And then the employer, of course, the premium is of utmost importance. And I think um, when you're looking at that true cycle, um, that bigger picture, we're definitely seeing that the innovations of, you know, being able to treat a person differently. Um, you talked about the me, even just the meals, if you can hone in and improve an employee's health, then you really do start to experience the longer term cost savings, as well as the improved quality. Uh, I don't know if anybody else would like to add to that really from a clinical perspective. Um, you know, Dr. Taconis, you touched briefly on the of the need for, or the reduced need for in-person visits, which of course is the most expensive way of treatment. Yeah, I know Jennifer, I, I mean, I think you covered the opportunity cost both for the employee and employer from a, a healthcare system perspective, you know, obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but we look at 10 year capital plans, for example. So, so you know, buildings, uh, building buildings, clinics, uh, hospitals, et cetera. Uh, we take into consideration now what percent, um, we assume certain percentages of telehealth in various scenarios in terms of, you know, small percent to, to as, as much as 50 to 60 percent and staying and sustaining that. What are the implications then for brick and mortar investment versus 
using most of that now to really uh, invest in technology, remote monitoring capabilities, um, as we are doing already, for example, virtual uh, on-demand exams. So Dr. John Saleh in Eugene, if she wanted a cardiology consultant, a cardiologist to, to evaluate the patient in the clinic, you know, with the title TYTO care peripherals uh, with an iPad, the cardiologist, wherever he or she may be, can actually listen to your heart and lungs um, from wherever they sit because of the, the virtual exam uh, capability. So these, these are the things that um, we are looking at, or and we are doing, uh, not only to to get those uh, convenient access wherever the patient may be, but also in terms of long term investments, pivoting from from brick and mortar. And, and lastly, if if uh, we think about the climate health footprint of of healthcare, we produce 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the country, and so the carbon intensity of visits is something uh, we actually have a paper that we'll be uh, looking to publish, uh, looking at our visits in KP Northwest, the reduction in the carbon intensity of our visits, uh, because it's not brick and mortar. And also when you think about the use of infrastructure, the roads uh, with less driving around because we have these capabilities. So. So it goes beyond individual, it goes beyond us as employers, but you know the totality in the community, if not global in terms of climate health. Yeah, that's a really good point. And then, you know, you, we're talking about the really broad goes beyond us. And then I would say it also pinpoints down to each patient um, because, you know, mm -hmm. some of the work you're passionate about, which is, you know, the social drivers of health and the equity work that we're trying to do, you know, particularly in behavioral health. I know we have seen yeah. a real positive aspect of being able to to provide a wider array of people that can treat a person's behavioral health through the telehealth perspective because you've taken the geography out of it. So if a person has right. very specialized needs or specific needs for, you know, a cultural fit or some sort of fit, that that's a way that we can address that too. Yeah, I just wanted to add that these are just all options to maintain quality of care. You know, by decreasing costs with brick and mortar doesn't mean that we are, you know, reducing quality of care. I see this every day in the video visits. I make a connection, we make diet, we make treatment plans, and we and the patient leaves feeling like they've they can go on about their day or their year. But I think we're getting better eye contact now with video visits than we are in the office with a mask and a face shield. Yeah. That's a yeah. good point. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I'll give it one more uh, minute and ask, is there anything else, uh, all four of the doctors, is there anything you wish I would have asked um, that I didn't or any, any point you wish you would have made while we were in uh, discussion? You know, I just let me throw two points out on cost savings because it certainly is top of mind for everybody who pays for healthcare. Um, one is prevention still matters and be able to detect disease early, manage the risk yeah. factors that we know. Cholesterol management and blood pressure management are still really important, and we still do a great job of those. And the pandemic hasn't start, stopped us. That's the stuff that we were doing digitally anyway. Uh, with pharmacy outreach by phone, uh, with mm -hmm. e-visits, with phone visits, with touches from medical assistants and nurses uh, helping helping our members manage their chronic condition. The other aspect of cost savings I think that makes us unique uh, is our pharmacy program, and we match this and benchmark against really every other health plan. We are really uh, market leading with a amazing generic drug program with the PMs, PMs going down every year um, for use of generic medications and our specialty and brand name drugs really being held flat because of our high purchase, partly because of our high volume purchasing, but more importantly, because of Permanente Medicine uh, and because how we practice evidence-based medicine. All of my physician colleagues are here, uh, are focused on a value-based 
performance and how can we get the best outcomes uh, at the most appropriate costs with the most appropriate drugs. That's a whole story on its own, but I just think when you talk about health savings, we can demonstrate it, we can show it, we can show how we are using uh, the expensive infused biosimilars at a rate well beyond everyone else in the country, using our mail order pharmacy that also saves money at a rate well beyond most other health plans. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bachman. Okay, well, I'd like, I'd like to take just a moment to thank all of the doctors that have joined us today. It's such a tr treat to have so much uh, brain power and commitment and just interesting uh, conversation. So thank you so much. And thank you to our audience who have taken this time. I know that you're busy and you have a lot of other competing priorities and we just appreciate your spending the time with us. So I will turn it over to Keith to close us out and just say be well and we hope to see you next time. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Jennifer. And I have to say, it seems as though Dr. Deconis has been tra practicing her ventriloquism uh, <laughs> because she has not moved. Uh, but she's, she's, speaking, so. she's on the call map. Yeah. She's I think call. Call. Yes. Yeah. No, seriously, I'd say, so thanks for the rich discussion. You know, uh, in terms of one observation I have is it just reminds me that medicine is such a team sport. And it's a team sport, not like uh, bowling or um, uh, what would be, I, I guess another one would be gymnastics, where it's just the individual. It's really more like synchronized swimming or soccer, where you have to play together. And I think we see that with, we have research, and they're bringing the latest science in terms of how do we develop our, and then deploy a COVID vaccine and make sure that's effective and then adjust um, as we learn more about that. Um, and they're seeing our Center for Health Resources seen as a trusted advisor with the CDC but they help us with it, knowing that medical dental integration, that we can leverage that. And to Dr. Bachman's point is really play to our strength, which is early detection so that you can, if you can't prevent something, you detect it early and then you can treat it most effectively. And the screenings that we have within Kaiser Permanente is what we're all about. And that helps us get that higher quality and manage our costs. So it really is about um, leveraging that as best we can. And I think, you know, really on the cutting edge of what can virtual do with this in terms of how do we make it more convenient? And we've seen that really accelerate over the last year. So again, just lots to learn. Appreciate the team um, coming together and sharing their time with us today. It's very valuable. And then in closing, uh, to let you know, we will be sending out links to documents so you don't have to worry about those in terms of websites. And then as you can see here, we would be remiss um, if we didn't emphasize just the, uh, the preventative nature in terms of wear a mask, wash your hands, stay six feet apart, avoid crowds, and then if you can, get a COVID vaccine if you haven't done so already. And then we'll get through this successfully together. So thank you uh, for joining us today. Be well and thrive. <laughs>